We're doing this series on the Bible story, and today we are doing the fall of Satan. And it's not exactly a story because there's no one passage that talks about it, but I thought, you know, we uh, dealt with the fall of man last week, and so I decided I, uh, Satan is involved in that story, and I thought it's worthwhile to just sort of trace through the scriptures what we know about Satan. Uh, we read in Genesis 3, we read about the serpent. He's not named as, a, as Satan there, but he isn't, the serpent isn't merely a serpent, as we talked about a little bit last time, but I'm going to take us through the scriptures and we'll see how he's identified in the scriptures. And somehow, <clears throat> we don't know exactly what happened there. We don't understand the idea of a, of a talking serpent. That doesn't make a lot of sense in some ways, but the Bible describes it this way. And so it must have been uh, some, uh, uh, some creature connected to Satan, delivering Satan's message. And so uh, it does cause curiosity. How and when did Satan fall? I think uh, in Milton's Paradise Lost, he has a section about this. I've never read it. It's a poem. Uh, it's very long. I think I have a copy. I think it's from my grandfather's books. Uh, but I've never even tried to read this. I have tried to listen to it on an audiobook, And it is quite uh, extensive. But I found it very hard to follow. But anyway, I think he has, a, he has the fall of Satan sometime prior to creation even, if I recall. And some people have talked about this. But I'm going to tell the story from the Bible point of view, and we are going to, uh, we're going to answer the question, when did Satan fall? What does his fall mean? Uh, the Bible talks about Satan being cast out of heaven. When did that happen? Or has it happened? So all these questions are, I think we'll touch on today. There are a lot of things we probably could ask about Satan, but we don't have answers for them. The ones that I'm going to answer today are the ones that we know anything about. And certainly Satan isn't something that we should focus our attention on. But I should make one thing clear before we get into discussing Satan. Adam is responsible for human sin. It is not Satan's fault that man sinned. Man sinned. That's the problem. Satan was the tempter, yes, but Adam was the sinner who plunged mankind into sin and death. So it no, does no good to blame human sin on Satan although he played a role. And he does have his own sin, and of course he's going to be judged for it. All right, so we're going to start with what I call the prequel, which is Genesis 1.31. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was every evening and there was morning, the sixth day. We're on the sixth day of creation. Notice it says that God has made, uh, saw all that he had made. And he has made all things. And the, um, so he, Satan is a part of all that he had made. He is uh, certainly, uh, he, is, he is not something that was pre-existent. He doesn't have eternal life. He is a creature. He's a creature of God. And notice it says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. What that tells me is that the fall of Satan has not yet happened on the sixth day of creation. Okay? Uh, and so Satan fell out of his position, but on this day, the sixth day of creation, on the seventh day of creation, that was not the day. All right, so let's go to the second thing then, which is Genesis 3, the serpent in the garden. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the tree, any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So what do we see about, this, about Satan here? We see that he is crafty. The serpent is crafty. He is deceitful. 
Okay, so he's deceiving Eve. And in fact, we see this in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Paul says, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And so here in 2 Corinthians, we, uh, Paul talks about the work of the serpent deceiving Eve. And then we go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Revelation 12, verse 9, it says, The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, we're going to come back to this passage. But I, want, I, I mention it because we're identifying the serpent of old, the serpent who deceived Eve, the serpent who was in the garden. So we don't know exactly when Satan fell. But at the latest, it was Genesis 3, verse 1. Now, my personal opinion is that is when he fell. I don't know how long Genesis 3, verse 1 is after the seventh day of creation. God made Adam and Eve on the sixth day. He, uh, he uh, put them in the garden. He instructed them. He, uh, they fellowshiped with God for a time. It seems there was a habitual meeting with God maybe on a daily basis. Uh, how long did that last? We don't know. But it says on this day, <clears throat> Satan, the serpent, was crafty, deceitful, came and deceived Eve. So clearly the fall of the serpent has happened, the fall of Satan has happened at this point. I think part and parcel of his fall is the fall of man. I think that he... This is how he displayed what was in his heart. You can say, okay, well, technically, he, he, he fell when his heart turned away from God. When did that happen? Well, we don't know exactly, but it was displayed when he deceived Eve. Okay, that's the Bible record. When we know for certain he has fallen, that's when. Okay? So, the next thing that we see, the serpent in heaven. You say, what? Yes, the serpent in heaven. So we're going to look at Job here. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Jo Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is a curious story. It, is, it reveals that at this point in time, whenever Job occurred, and we believe Job is roughly contemporary with Abraham, given the age uh, that he lived to. So he's roughly in the same era when people, according to the scriptures, were living to that age. Uh, and so what we have this curious event of Satan appearing before the Lord. He's in the presence of the Lord. So we call this the serpent in heaven. He has some kind of access, it seems, to heaven. He has some kind of access to God. So I'm going to show you another uh, verse, Romans, uh, Re Revelation 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, now this is after verse 9. Remember it says he's cast out of heaven. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. What was Satan doing when he was accusing Job? He was in the presence of God, somehow. He was accusing uh, Job as being, he's really accusing his motives for serving God. But does Job serve you for nothing? And so that is, that is apparently 
something that Satan was or is able to do, enter into the presence of God and accuse God's people before God. Right? That's part of what he has or is doing. I want to share another passage, which is Ezekiel 28, verse 11 to 19. Now, this is part of a, a judgment against the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was a real person. Tyre is part of Lebanon. Uh, I guess there's still a city called Sidon. So Tyre was on an island outside of Sidon. And Tyre, the king of Tyre is rebuked in this chapter by Ezekiel. But in the language, as he rebukes the, the um, uh, what's his name, the king of Tyre, there is language here that seems to go beyond Tyre. So just listen as we read this. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified, and you will cease to be forever. Now, this is a very curious passage. It's clearly, some of it is talking about the king of Tyre, who by his trade had made a name for himself, but God has condemned him and has uh, rebuked him. But there's language here that seems to go beyond even the description of a human being and apply to some being who is in the presence of God. Now, there's debate on this particular passage. Is he talking about Satan or is he not talking about Satan? I tend to think that he is using the king of Tyre as a type of Satan and that there is language in here that does apply to Satan. Clearly, there is a period in time when Satan has access into heaven of some kind but it is not the same as when he was created. When he was created, he walked amongst the stones of fire, it says. When he was created, had all this great beauty. Your beauty corrupted you and led you to uh, be destroyed and to be cast down. To the serpent in heaven. Now, I believe that what is, this is teaching us is that there is, there is a function of Satan where he does accuse the brethren. I believe he has access to God even until now. Even until now, he has somehow a, a way to speak to God, to accuse the brethren, to point out their weaknesses and follies and faults. The great thing that we have to answer is we have an advocate with the Father. All right, so I'm going to show you now the serpent cast out of heaven. Revelation 12, verses 7 to 12, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, 
because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, and having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Now this passage is in the middle of the tribulation period. It appears, according as we study the book of Revelation, that during that period, God is going to put an end to the access that Satan has to him and his, and his uh, courts in heaven. Whatever that access is, we see it in Job, we see it mentioned here. We don't know what it is exactly, but there's just the hint of it that he is able to go and accuse the brethren before God. That will end, but not until about the middle point of the tribulation. Satan is then cast down to the earth, and he, it says, Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So that is something that the world will be looking forward to, not with glee, that's for sure, but the serpent cast out of heaven. All right. And then the final destiny of the serpent. So after the tribulation period, and after the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, we see another reference to say, or before the thousand-year re- uh, term, we have see another reference to Satan. That's the first one, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him. So he had not deceived the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. All right, so what does this tell us? Well, first of all, there is some kind of binding of Satan during the thousand-year period of the millennial reign. And so what does that mean? It means that the person, the chief enemy of man, the devil, will be restricted will be imprisoned somewhere. He's a spirit, so this idea of a chain is probably not a literal chain, but it it symbolizes the restriction of the power of Satan so that he cannot interfere with the affairs of men for a thousand years. So that's the next step. After he's cast out of heaven, after the battle of Armageddon, when the armies of Satan and the beast are destroyed in the, bow, in the valley of Armageddon, then this is what will happen to him. Verse, uh, down to verse 7 in that chapter. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, And the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so this is the end of things for the serpent. What this means is at the end of the millennium, whatever bondage Satan will be in, he will be released from that bondage. And he will be allowed to go amongst men and deceive them once more. And by this period, after a thousand years of history, where men have been born into the world, and they have built whatever civilization is to come, many of these people apparently will not be regenerated people. And when Satan is released, they are ripe for the deception. And many of them will gather against those who are believers, to make war against them. And in that final conflict, God will ultimately destroy forever Satan and his power over men. That's the destiny of Satan. It's a very sad tale, the tale of Satan. I I believe that what the scriptures show us is, is enough that we can know that he is our enemy. We don't look into it to glory in all of these things, or to boast against the powers of Satan. But we want to be realistic and understand what the Bible teaches about, the, about his uh, person, 
about his activities historically and his activities as prophesied in the Scriptures. We also want to be reassured that our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who gives us victory over him and that, and that we can uh, have full assurance that our hope is in him and we need not fear the power of Satan, even though he accuses us, if he does, in the presence of God when we sin. Our God has defeated him and will bring him to final destruction at the end of the age. So that's the story of Satan. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this uh, survey of the Scriptures that teaches us what we need to know about the enemy of mankind, the serpent who had deceived Eve in the garden, who, who tr uh, troubles men every day, but who ultimately will be defeated by the power of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to be devoted to our God, to following after him every day. In Jesus' name, amen.